Go on, quick. I said, I'm doing this book about uh, about Marbella, the mafia in Marbella and all the intrigue that goes on. He said, that's nothing. He said, people are always coming up to me and ask me what it's like to be married to in this world. <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of the joke. <laughs> Excellent. You've got the laugh. Well, no, no. Let's turn to, well, we've got to, we must turn to Louise and Memorials. Sorry. <laughs> Which are even more, last, even more lasting than all these books. Because uh, she's a stonemason and letter carver. There is an exhibition called Cutting a Dash, the female line at the Lettering Arts Centre in Suffolk for the next month. It's, it's been a, a great revival of apprenticeships and so on, hasn't it? Uh, you're part of this. You, yeah, you found... there, was, there was more of a revival at the start of the 20th century because um, prior to that, industrialisation and the birth of printing had made the sort of skills that were first sort of but, but then there was Eric Gill and, and then Kindersley and Edward people like Johnston that. Edward Johnston trained yeah. Eric Gill and then there's been a whole sort of family tree of, of people training other people. So most people in the English speaking world can either trace their kind of training ancestry to either Edward Johnston who was at the start of the 20th century or the sort of parallel German yeah. training course. But what drew, what drew you to it in, in your generation? I was Why did you want to carve in stone? Well, I was a bit. I went a bit indirect. I got a psychology degree first of all, and decided I wasn't so academic that I could keep up with it. And so I took a year off and was a farm worker, where you just traipse <laughs> up and down fields, taking out oats and all types. And one of the people I worked with, they went and trained as a mason at Weymouth. And unfortunately, when I went to Weymouth, they'd lost the letter cutting tutor for a year. So I ended up as a mason at Hereford Cathedral and then subcontracted with the person that drew my portrait for the BP Portrait Award and um, was working on a big restoration project but I was slightly stuck in the rut at the end because the last year was just repointing bathstones with lime water <laughs> which is just a mind destroying job and then luckily I heard that what was then the Memorial Arts Charity which is now the Lettering and Commemorative Arts Trust had set up um, apprenticeship scheme, and there've been a lot of these these apprentices. And as yeah. I say, this is this has been a kind of a surge. But I'm interested that this this exhibition now is of 15 women letter carvers. And when on the air we trailed the fact that you were a woman doing this sort of stonemasonry task, there was cross tweets saying gender is irrelevant and so on. But do you think it is important to point out that actually women are doing it as as keenly as young men? I think it's a quite women in the exhibition because it's more sort of unexpected to weep for women to be in this industry. I think with lettering a lot of people think of women being calligraphers and not necessarily working with stone. But we're all trained the same. Everyone in the exhibition has had a formal apprenticeship like all the males in the exhibition. Letters, yeah. So it's a good um, industry for both sectors. Going to, but quite hard to get trained. The carving in stone is, is your thing. You were talking earlier on about memorials, and it does carry a powerful emotional charge, doesn't it? We seem yeah. to want to, it fits the sense of all things past, it's about us trying to remember people by carving names in stone. Do you have an emotional connection to it when you're doing memorials and gravestones? Yes, you can't help but have an emotional connection because you meet the family that are left behind, and often they'll bring photos and the and different things so I think if you didn't have a sort of sense of responsibility for creating something beautiful for that individual and you just had a sort of ego and just wanted to do your own thing then you're not the industry view. It's good. I, I, I work at the letter car yeah. for a, a memorial and there is this thing of even choosing a font matters yeah. terribly, doesn't it? Because a font has a mood about it. Sometimes, yes. Well, sometimes on the first meeting you do feel a bit mean because people, they know they want a headstone, but then you've got to ask them what stone and what font and what arrangement and what other words and you're just sort of bombarding them with questions so that you can get an idea so that you can work out a design. Sometimes you have people that do have very fixed ideas about the, what they want and then you can work with those to develop them. What's your favourite stone? 
Do you like it really hard and granitic or do you like the easy ones? I tend to mostly work with Cumbrian slate and York stone because they're very good for headstones. Um, but my favourite stone, if I've got some spare time while waiting for other stone, <laughs> is at the moment a thing called Ancaster Weatherbed, which is a Lincolnshire stone. And it's just beautiful because it's two colours and you can see all the fossils in it when you polish it up. Do you ever think of what words you'd want on a stone of your own? No, we tend to just be scattered in our family. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so I think, yeah, it would... I suppose we'd have Bruce Forsyth Entertainer. Frederick Forsyth, what, what would you want on yours if you could have one word? Ne never beat Spike Milligan's, I told you. I oh, feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one that you should do, Spike, is Bill Matter with Spike Milligan, Spike Milligan, the performing man. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be good. Tim Angel, any, any thought of costumier or what no, would you I like on my, yours? My dad always used to say, because <clears throat> I'm, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, you know, getting old or whatever, the alternative is better, but I think if on my headstone I put the alternative was better, meaning, yes, yeah, so, well. Do you know, people always think they'll want a joke, but actually in the end what the family wants is a <laughs> solid word. Entertainer, costumier. Yeah. Uh, Can I put my order in now? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite impressive. <laughs> well, that's it, I'm afraid, for this week. We're out of time. Thanks to Louise Tipley, Frederick Forsyth, Tim Angel, and Sir Ruth Forsyth, who I hope will now give us all a little tap dancing lesson. Uh, back next week, when Among Us will be Brian Blessed. Goodbye. Midweek was presented by Libby Purvis, and the producer was Paula McGinley. On Long Wave in a moment, it's the Daily Service, while on FM in Reading Europe, David Wagner will ask whether German literature still shows any signs of an East-West divide. Now, here's Evan Davis. How do you value something like a painting? What makes one artist worth more than another? Who decides what's in vogue? And why do they have so much power to lead tastes? Well, the bottom line is returning to BBC Radio 4, and to begin, we have a discussion on taste and value in the art world. It's with a panel, including Grayson Perry, who says that a big part of being a good artist is handling success. Find out how in a new series of The Bottom Line with me, Evan Davis, starting tomorrow evening at half past eight, and then available on the BBC Radio 4 website. On Longwave and DAB Digital Radio now, it's time for the Daily Service, led by the Reverend Peter Whitaker.